Hello everyone. So today we're going to be talking about Stokes' theorem. Now uh, previously we've been talking about these surface integrals and before that we were talking about Green's theorem. Now if you look on the screen here, uh, I have in red here that says that Stokes' theorem extends Green's theorem into R space 3. This means that we're using the same concept that we did in Green's theorem, except now we're going to extend it into R space 3, which means we're not just going to be looking at some flat surface. All right, this surface is going to have some sort of curve to it, which means it's going to be some surface that is implemented in R space 3, uh, sort of like a paraboloid, a uh, hyperbolic paraboloid, uh, paraboloid of one sheet, of two sheets, so on and so forth. All right, so to start off, let's look at Stokes' theorem. So Stokes' theorem says, let S be an oriented smooth surface that is bounded by a simple closed smooth boundary curve C with positive orientation. All right, and I'm gonna stop right there simply because this says that we must define some boundary on this surface and that boundary must be a curve and that curve must be or must have positive orientation. Again, very, very similar to Green's theorem because again, Green's theorem bounded a region and the bounding of the region was that curve and that's exactly what we see here in Stokes' theorem. Let's continue. We're also gonna let F be a vector field then what we get here, now I want you to pay attention to what we're looking at here. So on the left hand side of this equation here, we're left, or we start with a line integral. So starting with a line integral, we then say, okay, well, if we want to evaluate this line integral, and we can, because again, we are looking at a smooth boundary curve, a simple closed smooth boundary curve, similar to Green's theorem, then we naturally are going to use a double integral or we're going to use a surface integral here. All right, so we're using a surface integral for the curl of F with respect to that surface. All right, now in here on the green letters or on the green, uh, the green region here, <laughs> the green sentence here. It says that the curl vector measures the rotation of F at each point in the region around an axis parallel to the unit basis vector K. Now, if you remember how we defined the curl back in one of the previous sections, that's exactly what we're doing here. We're defining or we're using that curl to identify what is going to be the surface integral. So if you need a refresher on what the curl is, uh, I'll post a card on the, on the, in this video on the top right hand corner and you'll be able to be linked to that video. So you can just go ahead and click it. All right. Uh, don't mind my dog in the background. She's going crazy. She's trying to eat her tail or something. All right. So let's now start doing an example here. So we want to use Stokes theorem to evaluate this surface integral, all right, a surface integral because we're integrating over a surface with respect to that surface and we want that curl, all right. So we're doing this, oops, excuse me, wrong one. So we want to use Stokes theorem here and then they give us the vector field function. The vector field function in R space 3, that's nice, and we're also going to get a surface. The surface is a part of this surface z is equal to 5 minus x squared minus y squared and above the plane z is equal to 1. All right so in here we have this uh, circular paraboloid or we could just say we have this paraboloid that we're looking at and what we want to do is we want to make sure that surface is above the plane z is equal to 1. And then here it's telling us that we're going to assume that S is oriented upwards. So if you remember back with surface integrals, we needed to have a certain orientation for this surface. We're going to say that the surface is orientated upwards, therefore every normal vector will be facing away from the region that bounds this specific, uh, 
or sorry, we're going to be, the normal vector is going to be pointed away from the region that the surface is bounding. So let's get a quick depiction of what's going on here. All right, so this here looks like more of a circular paraboloid. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do my best to try to sketch it out first, and then we'll go ahead and we'll go to GeoGebra to verify what we have here. All right, so here's my paraboloid that I'm envisioning here. looks like this and it is opening downward all right so it's opening downward and it has a z intercept of 5 all right so if i were to draw a z axis here the z axis then would intersect at 5 and then z is equal to 1 well this would be a 1 here and then we would be able to see the x and the y axis as such. So let's go through and let's go check on GeoGebra see if we got this correct. Alright, so I'm here on the GeoGebra class, so I'm going to scroll all the way downward, all the way down, and I'm going to go to Stokes Example 1. So going here to Stokes Example 1, uh, we're going to be able to see here this surface. So again, it's that elliptic paraboloid that was opening downward. That's nice, or circular paraboloid. Now, notice, I also went through and I also bounded this specific surface by this region here, or by this curve. Now, remember Stokes' theorem said that if we have a surface, we're gonna have a boundary for that surface. And that boundary is this curve right in here that I outlined in black. So, we now want to identify all of this as we're working through this specific example. All right, so now that we know that we got this, let's go back to the whiteboard and finish off this example. All right, here we are. Now, I'm gonna say here that because we have to assume that S is oriented upwards, again, it's gonna have some positive orientation, then that means that every normal vector on this surface is moving or it's pointed away from that surface. And again, normal vectors are just 90 degree angles to that surface. All right, so these are all the normal vectors that we are going to be considering when we're doing this uh, integration. All right, now, again, there's two parts to this. Number one, we can use we can use Stokes' theorem to say that we can evaluate this line integral, or we can use Stokes' theorem as a double integral or as a surface integral for the curl of that vector field. So again, there's two portions to this. Now, what I'm going to do in this particular case is I'm going to outline this curve here, and let's actually do this in orange. This is my curve C. It has positive orientation. So it's going to be moving in that direction. All right, counterclockwise orientation. My surface, my surface is this region here. Oops, excuse me there. So this is my surface S up here. All right, and that's the whole hyperbola that uh, that whole elliptic paraboloid that we're looking at. All right, so here we go. What I want to do first is I want to find Oops. Excuse me there. I want to find the curve C that is the intersection of the surface oops, 
and z is equal to 1. So let's go ahead and let's find that intersection. All right, because again, if we find the intersection, then that means we found that curve. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to set both of the equations equal to one another. So this is going to be 5 minus x squared minus y squared is going to be equal to 1. Because again, this is a surface on the left side, and on the right side is a plane z is equal to 1. Now, if we solve for this, then we're naturally going to get that x squared plus y squared is going to be equal to 4. So this is the curve C. Curve C. Now, the curve C is circular, so what I want to do is I want to then go ahead and parameterize that curve. So then I'm going to say, let's go ahead and let's parameterize this. So the parameterization of C, that's going to be that my curve for C is now parameterized by, since it's just a circle of radius 2, uh, I'm going to parameterize as 2 cosine, uh, let's say t, because I define t here. So 2 cosine t and 2 sine t as my curve, and that's going to be on the k component, or the z value of z is equal to 1. So that's a parameterization for the curve that I'm looking at. And the reason why I want to parameterize this curve is specifically because I want to use the first part of Stokes' theorem here, which means I want to use this line integral. So once I have this parameterization going for us, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start solving the problem. We're going to take this uh, surface integral for the curl of f dot ds, and this is going to be equal to the line integral for the vector field dot dr. Now this just turns into a problem from line integrals back from early chapter 16. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to evaluate this line integral here. I'm going to say use previously learned techniques. So if I'm integrating this line integral over the curve C, well, the curve C, the curve C goes all the way around, right? It's a closed curve, which means it goes from 0 to 2 pi. My vector field, well, I'm going to take my vector field and I'm going to compose it with my parameterization for the curve, and this is going to be dot r prime of t dt. Now again, remember, this was from line integrals back from early chapter 16. So we're going to go through those uh, through that representation. So this is now the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Now this means that my vector field, so my vector field here, I need to input all of my parameterizations that I just found. So my vector field, let's see, I'm going to have my z value, z value under the parameterization was 1, right, this was x, y, and z, so my z value for my vector field needs to be 1 squared, all right, simply because of that, second component minus 3 times x, x is 2 cosine t, times y, and y is 2 sine t, there we are, and the last component, the k component, that's going to be x cubed, so x cubed multiplied by y cubed, So my x component was 2 cosine t, and then my y component was 2 sine t. There we are. Now we need to find the dot product here with the derivative of my parameterization. 
So let's go ahead and let's find that derivative of that parametrization. Actually, let's just erase all this. There we go. So let's find the derivative of that parametrization. So the derivative of that parametrization is going to be negative two sine t, two cosine t, and zero. And that's all going to be dt. All I need to do now is figure out what this dot product is. So from zero to two pi, we're going to get, let's see, the x components are gonna multiply and that's gonna leave us negative two sine of t plus, or in this case, minus, because of a negative here, two cosine t times negative three times two cosine times two sine t. So let's see, two times two, that's four, four times three, that's 12, 12 times two, that's gonna be 24, so that's gonna be minus 24, and this is going to be cosine squared t, sine t, and then plus the last component, uh, the last component is just zero, because it multiplies out, and this is going to just be dt. Nice. So all we get to do at this point in time is we get to evaluate this integral. All right, so I see a negative two that I can factor, so I'm gonna factor out a negative two. This is going from zero to two pi. All right, and we're gonna evaluate for sine of t plus 12 cosine squared t sine t dt. Nice. So all we have to do now is evaluate this. And what I want you to do is I want you to go through and I want, to, I want you to figure out what this uh, integral is going to be. The first term is a really nice integration. The second term, you're probably gonna have to use a u substitution, but it is not too bad. All right, so I want you to go through and figure out what that integral is. Put pause on the video, take time and do that now. All right, here comes the answer, so spoiler alert, if you haven't put pause, please go ahead and put pause. And here we go. The answer is zero. Nice. All right, so now what we wanna do is we wanna use Stokes' theorem again, but we wanna see how both versions of Stokes' theorem is gonna work, all right, or how both of them are working. So let's go through and let's do an example where we're going to have to use both of these uh, methods both of these methods, as we saw here in the theorem, we're gonna use the left side, we're gonna use a line integral to evaluate that uh, boundary, and we're also gonna use a surface integral to evaluate that integral to find uh, what this value is gonna give us. All right, so let me write up the example and I'll be right back. All right, so here's the next question. We want to use both versions of Stokes' theorem for this given vector field, which component-wise is negative y, 2x, and x plus z, and the upper hemisphere with positive orientation for x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to one. And again, we wanna use both versions of Stokes' theorem. So we wanna use the first part of Stokes' theorem, which is the line integral, and then we wanna use the second part, which is going to be the surface integral. All right, so here what we have is uh, an upper hemisphere. And I'm gonna go to GeoGebra and show you that picture really quick, and then I'm gonna go back and uh, attempt to sketch it. All right, so here we are again on the GeoGebra class. We're gonna scroll downward, and here we are, Stokes example two. And we're gonna see here this upper hemisphere of radius, or sorry, this hemisphere of radius one, and it's only the upper hemisphere that we're looking at for this sphere. All right, so again, we have a boundary curve. That boundary curve is going to be this curve that I am traversing here. And again, I wanna traverse this in a counterclockwise orientation, just like so. And then the surface is going to be this blue surface that we're analyzing here. So again, two components. One component uses the curve that we're gonna be integrating over. The second component includes the surface that we're going to be integrating over. So again, those two different surfaces, we're gonna to have to start observing them. Or sorry, those two items, we're gonna to have to start observing them. One being a curve, the other one being a surface. So let's go through those uh, calculations. 
All right, so we're back here on this uh, whiteboard, and here I have this upper hemisphere. All right, again, uh, we're gonna be analyzing two different components. One component is going to be this curve down below. All right, let's make this a little bit more prominent here. There we are. So one of the items that we're gonna be analyzing is going to be this curve. We're gonna call that curve uh, C. And the other portion that we're going to be analyzing is going to be the surface of this hemisphere. And the surface of this hemisphere, let's see if uh, we can do this here, is going to be this given surface here. And we're just going to call this surface S. Alright, so there's two different components that we're looking at. Now, for the first component, we're going to use the first part of Stokes' theorem. So in here, I'm going to say first part of Stokes' theorem. So use first part of Stokes' theorem. All right, since we're going to use the first part of Stokes' theorem, then that means that we're going to have to use that first line integral. So we're going to have to be looking at the line integral over the curve for this vector field with respect to that curve. <coughs> Excuse me. So in order to do this, I need a parameterization for the curve. So that means that I need to find a parameterization. So find parameterization for the curve C. All right, well, the curve C, again, if you recall, when we put an axis on here, and we have our Z component, our X, and our Y components, uh, the curve is actually on the X and Y plane, which for us, that means that Z is going to be zero. So when I'm looking at my parameterization, my R of T for my curve, this is going to be just a circular curve, so that's gonna be cosine T, and it has radius of one because of my sphere has radius one. Cosine T, sine T, and my Z component is zero because again, we're only getting this circle on the X and Y coordinate system. Uh, since this is a case, I know that when I'm finding this line integral, I'm going to need a derivative. So let's go ahead and take the derivative really quickly. Our prime of T is going to be sine of T, sorry, negative sine T, then cosine of T and still zero. There we are, all right, looking pretty good. So. What I'm going to have next is going to be that this integral, this line integral, is going to be traversed from 0 to 2 pi. All right, because again, it's a, it's a circle all the way around. So 0 to 2 pi is what we're looking at here. And we're now going to compose my vector field with my curve. And we're going to find the dot product with the derivative of the vector, sorry, with the derivative of the curve and then this is going to be dt. So again, from zero to two pi. Let's find that composition here. So that composition, I'm gonna have my, let's see, this is going to be, the first component is negative y, so I need to figure out what my y component is. And again, y component, so naturally our curve just becomes x, y, and z. So in my vector field, I have negative y, so this is going to be negative my y component, which is just going to be sine of t. All right, my second component is 2x, so 2 times x, x is cosine of t. And then my z component, which is going to be x plus z. So x plus z. Here we go, x was cosine of t, z was zero, so there we are. Here is my vector field composed with my parameterization of the curve. And I need to take the dot product between this and the respective derivative. So this is negative sine t, cosine t, zero, dt. 
this is going to be from 0 to 2 pi and this is now dot product negative sine t times negative sine t that's going to give us sine squared t the next one's going to be plus 2 cosine squared t 2 cosine squared t there we are looking good and then uh, the last one's going to be just 0 so that's not too bad all right, sine squared t plus 2 cosine squared t, and this is all dt. All right, it's looking pretty good. Uh, it kind of looks like we might have to do some power reduction here, or we can actually bypass that one of the power reductions if we use sine squared t as 1 minus cosine squared t. I believe this actually has us bypass that power reduction for that sine squared t. So this is going to be 1 minus cosine squared t plus 2 cosine squared t dt, which means that integral is just from 0 to 2 pi, and it's going to be 1 plus cosine squared t dt, which makes it slightly easier. Uh, in this case, we only have to use one power reduction, and that power reduction is going to be for cosine squared t. All right, so that's really nice. Now, um, if you want to go ahead and do this integral, then go ahead and put pause on the video. Go ahead and do that integral. But at this point in time, I'm just going to give you the answer of 3 pi. And that's it. So this is the first part of Stokes theorem just using line integrals to figure out what is the value that we're looking for. Now we're going to use the second part of Stokes theorem. All right. So here goes this second part for Stokes theorem. So I'm just going to draw this line here and now I'm going to say use second part of Stokes theorem. That means that we're going to need to find, oops, that means that we're going to need to find what is the curl of the vector field. So we need to find this curl of the vector field in order for us to be able to work with this directly. All right, so let's go through and let's now start finding that curl of this vector field. Alright, so that's where I want to start. So, really quickly before I do that, I'm going to say here that the second part of Stokes theorem says that we need to uh, take a surface integral for the curl of my vector field dot ds. Alright, so again, this is that second part of Stokes theorem. So, let's start working with that and let's start to figure out what the curl is going to be. All right, so with this, I'm gonna do this in uh, the color for this specific surface, which looks like kind of like a pink color. So let's find that curl. So the curl of F, remember curl just means that we take the cross product of the gradients and that vector field, or in this case, del and that vector field, which means we need the I, J, and K components del is just the operator for the partial derivatives with each component or for each component and then the vector field well the vector field was what was given to us which was negative y which was then 2x and which was x plus z so when we find this curl this curl actually simplifies to be real nice all right, I'm not going to show the work here, but if you want to go through the work, go ahead, please uh, do so. The curl is going to be 0, negative 1, and 3. All right, that doesn't look too bad at this point in time. All right, looks pretty good. All right, so now that I have this, what I want to do is I want to then start interpreting what is this integral telling me here. 
All right. Now, remember, once we have to calculate this surface integral, this surface integral, by definition, when we were looking at the previous section, tells us that we have to then integrate over that surface for the curl of F, and this is going to be with the normal component of this specific vector or the, ve the normal vector for that surface. Now, notice the difference in between these two. The first part just said, hey, we want to find this surface integral with respect to the surface, and then we said, okay, well, if we need to do that, then we're still going to find that surface integral, but in this particular case, it's going to be the normal vector, which is going to be normal to the surface that we're looking at. So in that particular instance, we then need to find that normal vector. So I'm going to say here, in green, we need to find the normal vector to s. So that's the second piece that we need to do. So what I'm going to do really quickly is, I, in order to do that, I'm going to parameterize the surface. Remember, if we parameterize the surface s, then naturally we can extract the partial derivatives to give us a cross product of those of that parameterization to that surface to give us that normal vector. So I'm going to use that parameterization technique that I learned back in the previous sections. So I'm going to say I'm going to parameterize this. Uh, now this is a sphere, so that surface in, par in parameterization we can use theta and we can use phi. All right, if you want to use u's and v's, perfectly fine. Again, I typically use thetas and phi's specifically because it's an easier transition for that parameterization. So parameterizing this uh, sphere of radius one is going to get us sine phi, cosine theta, sine phi, sine theta, and it's going to give me a cosine phi taking the partial derivatives, so I need a partial derivative with respect uh, to theta, so that first one is going to be negative sine phi sine theta, the next one's going to be sine phi cosine theta, and the last one's going to be zero, and then we take the cross, or sorry, then we take the partial derivative with respect to phi, uh, which is then going to give us cosine phi, cosine theta, cosine phi, sine theta, and finally negative sine phi. All right. So we got what's going on here. We got this cross, or sorry, we got these partial derivatives. Now we need to find the cross product between these two. And remember, the cross product is going to get us that normal vector that we're going to be looking for. All right, so here we go. To find this cross product, uh, all you're going to do is take the first partial derivative, cross it with the second partial derivative for that parameterization of surfaces. Now, I'm not going to show the work here. I'm going to go straight into what we actually get. So I want you to actually go through the actual work because again, I need to see this work being done when you're doing this on an exam in order for, to get full credit. If the work is not shown on the exam, I'm going to assume that you use outside sources and you will not get credit for that example. So please make sure that you're showing all your work. Again, I want you to show that cross product as we're working through it. All right, so we got everything going here so far. All right, that's looking good. So this here is this normal vector that I was initially looking for, like we said over here. All right, so we parameterized, there we go. And then we were able to extract that normal vector. Now, I'm gonna be looking for the dot product between the curl and the normal vector. So let's find that really quickly the curl of f dot with the normal vector. 
the curl we were able to extract as 0, negative 1, 3. Well, this dot product here for this here, let's uh, copy it and let's put it down here. There we are. Looking good. Now I wish it would just let me move it while I did that. Nope, I don't want to move just that. Cheese and crackers. All right, there we are. Perfect. So we're taking the dot product here of the curl and this specific value. So when we take this dot product, we're going to be able to find that the dot product just turns into sine of theta times sine squared phi plus three cosine of theta sine phi. Alright, so three, oops, my apologies. This one in here is cosine phi. My apologies. Uh, because three times this is going to be all right, let's see, uh, and I believe, all right, looking good so far. All right, so we have everything here, I believe that we need, and let me see, I think I might be missing a piece. Ah, yes, um, missing a piece here, uh, specifically, uh, my apologies, I forgot to reorient my surface. Let's go back on that. I'm actually going to move this downward uh, because I need to make a modification here. So let's go ahead and let's move this downward just a little bit. There we are. All right, technology is nice when it works. N needs to be pointed outward and the reason n needs to be pointed outward is because at the very beginning they gave us that the upper hemisphere has positive orientation that means that every normal vector that we find must be perpendicular to that given surface now the issue that we have right now in the reason as to why I said, hey, there's an issue here, is because look at this vector. All of these values have negative components. If all of those values have negative components, and that means at this point in time, all of the vectors are pointed inward towards that surface or towards that area, towards that volume that is being bounded by this surface. We don't want those vectors to be pointed inward. In that sense, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of these vectors or take all of these components and just multiply by negative, right? Take the opposite of those vectors. That way, we can then just start talking about the positive orientation. Here we are. So, from this point in time, I took all of these values for the vector that was making it negative and I made them positive. That way we would have positive orientation for this vector. So now naturally when I take then the dot product, I now get this specific value. Awesome. So let's keep going now. Now that we're able to extract this, I'm going to keep going here and I'm going to say that my double integral or my surface integral that I'm looking at is really a double integral over a region that I am observing for this curl for this curl of the vector field dot the dot product and this is going to be with respect to the area that this region D is encompassing so now the region D we now need to find out what that region D is so let's do the work on that Region D is the projection of S 
onto we're going to use in this particular case uh, since it's a sphere we can easily project this onto the x and y plane so onto the x and y plane Well, what does that projection look like? That projection just looks like uh, a circular region that's bounded. In other words, a circular disk. So naturally, when I want to figure out what this integration is, and I'm going to use one of my little techniques here. I'm going to use my little happy face argument. Once you see the happy face, you teleport down here. And we start off where we left off. That's a double integral over that region. Now the curl dot product n, well we already found that. That curl dot product n, that was this value that we found over here, so that was at negative sine theta sine squared phi oops, sine squared phi plus 3 cosine phi sine phi. All right. That was this middle portion. Now it's going to be dA. So this dA is going to be with respect to the area. So because we have our parametrization already done, we don't need to go back into the x and y plane. We just need to keep using this parametrization that we're using. right? If we were using u's and v's, then everything would be in u's and v's, and we'd all be very nice. So. We now need to figure out what is this parametrization for the surface? What are the parameters bounded by? All right, so let's now figure out those parameter bounds. Well, the parameter bounds, theta. Theta is one of the easiest ones to calculate because if you notice the surface here, well, the surface goes all the way around as such, which means theta is going from 0 all the way to 2 pi. So that's kind of nice. Theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Now we need phi. Remember phi is the angle, the angle which is made by the positive z-axis and the traversing of this surface down to where it stops. And it stops at the x and y plane. Therefore this angle measurement for phi here is just from 0 all the way down to pi halves. So phi starts at 0 and it ends at pi halves. So coming over here to my double integral, well now double integral wise, I'm now going to be able to set this up from 0 to pi halves and then from 0 to 2 pi and this is going to be for negative sine theta sine squared phi plus 3 cosine phi sine phi and I use uh, theta first so this is going to be d theta d phi and again we were not changing variables here because we were using our initial parametrization in this particular case we can actually evaluate this it's not going to be too bad of an integral to evaluate uh, once you get to the phi uh, to integrating phi so sine squared phi we're going to have to use a power reduction here it's not going to be too bad all right but in this particular instance once you do the work and again i want you to show the work because on the exams i need to see that work all right that answer is going to be three pi so notice, the answer that we got here, 3 pi, is the exact same answer that we got up here, which was 3 pi. Which means that Stokes' theorem doesn't matter what version we use, we can either use the first version that does this technique with the parametrization of the curve that is bounding the surface, or we could do the whole parametric or the, we can do the curl we can integrate over that curl with respect to the surface one or the other which means we're always going to get the exact same answer all right again it's going to be of your choosing awesome so that is now all of uh, stokes theorem that i wanted to talk about so the next portion, the next portion is going to be the divergence theorem and uh, I'll see you all back for that divergence theorem.